Hello, hello, hello. How you guys doing? Welcome. Zach, what's up, brother? Long time no see, man. Let's get on a phone call on Monday. I'm having a conversation with Kevin about some stuff with Pernod. Let's chat. A lot of great people signing in already. Appreciate you guys. We are waiting for the man of the hour, Raj Bhakta. He's going to be joining us shortly. Hey, Liquid Guilt, how you doing, brother? Robin Cooper, how you doing? Whiskey Girl Collection, how you doing? Coming in from Australia, appreciate that. Can you guys hear me fine? Can you guys see me fine? Any audio video issues? Good. Let's see, let's see. Bear with me, guys, for a minute. We have an exciting Instagram live today. Oh my God, Spirited Tracy in the house. Thank you so much for joining. You're the absolute best. Oh, here he comes. Here he comes. The man of the hour. Let's invite him, shall we? Hope you guys are doing all right. It's almost the weekend. Hello. There he is. Look at that. How you doing, Raj? Right, you're looking you're looking pretty cool there, my friend. Huh? Yeah, Somewhere. you know, I Jack was Nicholas. wondering I was wondering how to match your coolness. So, you know, oh, I couldn't think of go. any other better way. Here Sunglasses we go. was the only way. Here we go. Good to see you. Good to be here, buddy. <laughs> All jokes aside. I've never uh, done this. You're taking my Instagram live uh, virginity here, my friend. Oh, that's awesome. I'm blushing. This is the first time for everything and are you, uh, do you consider yourself a little techie or, or more? No. no, no, I'm what you would call a Luddite, like, you know, lagging years behind the trends and not particularly <laughs> a fan of technology. I would have been the guy who didn't like the locomotive and said, you know, the good horse and buggy with the old horse and buggy was good enough. So <laughs> what are you going to do? That's why I'm into old, old, into old brandy. You know, I'm an old soul. I like all this history and stuff like that. Yeah, you know what? Uh, that's a very great point. Uh, with what we're going to talk about today, there's a lot of great history there. And uh, it, it, it's pretty amazing once we really just take a sip and think about, you know, all the years that go in that barrel. Uh, that's amazing. Absolutely. So, guys, uh, welcome. It's 830 officially. Tonight's Poison Jazz here. We have a very, very special guest. Uh, probably, and, and uh, no offense to any guests I've had before, uh, probably the most special guest I've had on my Instagram before. Uh, from the world. And uh, Raj Bhatta is here from Bhatta Farms, Bhatta 50, and the maverick behind uh, Whistlepig Whiskey, the guy who created you really, You really nailed the pronunciation, Jazz. I have to get it. Yes, you know. Yes, yes. I am uh, excellent at uh, the last name pronunciation for you. Very good. Very uh, I can't good. do the Irish part, but I can do the Indian <laughs> part. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. So we got Raj Bhatta here. He is the founder, creator of Whistlepig. Uh, I believe he's not involved with the brand anymore, but he's on to some other projects. We're going to be talking about his newest project, Pata. Um, Raj, welcome. Great to be here, Jez. Great to be here, buddy. That's a hell of a collection you've got there behind you. Yeah, you know, about one third of my collection does not sum up to the age and beauty of the 50-year-old which goes into Pata. You know, it, it, I, I think you're actually right, to tell you the truth. <laughs> the, 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 that is a true statement. I got a lot of 8-year, 12-year, 15-year-old back there. But, uh, yeah, it's tough to match up to that one for sure. So, Raj, uh, you know, people watching, uh, they know of you possibly. But, you know, maybe they don't know as much about you as I would like for them to. So tell us a little bit about yourself mm -hmm. and your background. Sure. I, I'll start, Jazz, uh, if it makes sense to you, with how I got into the liquor business. Uh, which was totally by chance uh, back in, well, I, I'll take it. So in 2004, I was working in the family business. My father is an Indian hotelier and, you know, he was, um, let's just say, uh, I was at a hotel in Vail in Colorado and getting, and it's a ski town, an expensive ski town. He's operating hotels in a whole bunch of different places and he's like, why are you paying people $15 per hour? You're throwing away my money, you know, giving me like full, frankly, all the time that I've raised, he's raised some spoiled white boy and I'm just throwing away money. 
and he's forgotten <laughs> how the money is made the hard way. So I, I want to get out of the family business, right? He's, 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 he's killing me. And, um, and there was a TV show called The Apprentice at the time. And a friend calls me up and I'm living in Vail. And by the way, the backstory on Vail for a second, it's a ski town. There are like seven guys to every three girls. Which means that if you're a single guy in the town, the odds are horrible for you. So <laughs> as the 27 year old single guy, you know, my love life is going very badly. I can't stand working for my dad. My friend calls me up because what are your two biggest problems? I'm like, well, uh, you know, the girl situation and, uh, you know, working with my dad. And he goes, I got the perfect solution to both. He goes, go on The Apprentice. Your dad's going to think it's great. And being on TV is definitely going to be good for your love life. It's the biggest show on TV. And I said, you know what? I'm a serious guy. I'm not going to go into some TV game show. And, but I thought about it, and he had a point. And it got me my peace with honor exit. I got out of the family business, went on The Apprentice, which was actually a tough show to get onto at the time. It was season number two. The first, one was a, first season was a hit. I made it on. And then... You know, you become instantly famous, uh, which is, by the way, an interesting thing to see how people react to that. But let me get to the liquor business here. So um, basically that TV turned into some political commentary on the cable news networks and then a race for Congress. I lose the race for Congress. Very bad year for uh, members of the Republican Party in 2006. Um and uh and i'm depressed you know so i i can't win a tv game show uh the apprentice i can't win a congressional race and uh, actually then i went to india uh so you remember steve Irwin? you remember the crocodile hunter guy yeah uh he he had just died and i thought it'd be really funny if there were an indian guy you know doing the crocodile hunting and this stuff you know with the head bobble and the like i thought it would be amazing tv so I went all through India trying to find the Indian Steve when I can't find it. So that's number three strikeout. And I well, you know, it's pretty easy one... to, to hunt for crocodiles sitting on an elephant. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but country's got 1.4 billion people, Jazz, and I can't find one guy. So, like, I can't win a TV game show. I can't win a race for Congress. I can't find Steve Irwin in, uh, in, uh, in India. So I figure we got a little accompaniment here. I figure like I'm becoming hey, a loser, right? Ethan, how you doing? And I'm, uh, Hi, Ethan. He's a hey, ham. And this is my, my swimsuit. Oh, your swimsuit. Okay, wave hi. Hi. Okay, so uh, let, let's get to where, where was I? So I uh, buy the farm in Vermont. That's 2007. I figure I'm going to go up there, you know, wait till Jesus talks to me about what I should do next. Very romantic idea sitting on 500 acres, then the economy collapses in 2008. So I've got literally, you know, I, I, now I'm broke. You gotta be quiet, okay? If you wanna sit here, you gotta be quiet. The, so now I've got, I've got no money, I'm broke on a farm, and I'm wondering what the hell I'm gonna do. Friend of mine, long story short, tells me to look at a company called Vermont Vodka. I looked at the vodka business. I had the same misconception that so many had that you can't go broke in the liquor business, right? I mean. But thank God I had I was ignorant because that's what got me into it. And then I did Vermont Vodka. Didn't really I didn't really like the business. I didn't like the supply and demand dynamics. I then got into then looked at a company called Puddletown, and that's when I realized they did Hudson Valley. I think it was Hudson Baby Bourbon. A number of things. It got sold to William Grant. Anyway, I saw that. I loved that business. I love the model. I always dreamed of being in the whiskey business, right? But I didn't think, I mean, you know, I knew, and I loved high-end whiskey. I've been drinking high-end whiskey all my life. I knew you have, you need at least 10, 12 years before a whiskey is good, right? At least eight, you know, especially for scotch. And I think I'll never be able to do that. And that's when I met Dave Pickerel. So I said at a certain point, screw it, I'm going to build a still. And Dave Pickerel, for those who don't know, was my master distiller at Maker's Mark. He was the master distiller at, uh, uh, sorry, he was my master distiller at Whistlepig. And previously, he was the master distiller at Maker's Mark. Probably one of the most amazing men in the history of the business. Um, and I was very lucky to partner up with him, which is itself an interesting story. And that began Whistlepig. Whistlepig is obviously a big success. 
Uh, I sold it last year, and now I'm doing my magnum opus that I'm putting my name on, uh, which is Bakta, uh, and it's a 50-year-old Armagnac brandy finished in scotch casks. You're so sorry for that long a little bit. Answer. No, that was great. That was that summarized three or four points that I was going to bring up. Uh, you're a great storyteller, which we'll get to later with this beautiful book that you've designed in the Bakta 50. Talk about sucking you in, great story, kind of summarizing your journey to make Bakta 50. This is phenomenal. We're going to talk about this in a second. Uh, I wanted to touch a little bit on the point of you selling yourself a little bit short really quickly about talking about Whistlepig. But Whistlepig at the time, when you created it, there was no craze for rye. Rye's, rye's were kind of almost looked yeah, at. Rye, 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 was like your, it, rye was like your, your, your broke, dumb, drunk uncle's drink, right? I mean, rye was not hot. But um, I sensed that it had, and it's the same thing with Armagnac, by the way. And, and I think, by the way, Rye was an up and coming, if Rye was, let's say, a five on the potential scale, this is a 10. And I'll tell you why. But the, the in essence, this is the same sort of thing. I love finding old, underappreciated, uh, unappreciated gems. And I get a kick out of it. I don't know. I say, I'm an old soul. You know, and I love, I, I was always, when I was a little kid in Europe and I would go through the castles, I would imagine what the kings and the queens were doing at the time. And, you know, I've had this love of history. And I particularly, I'm, and I'm a romantic in the sense that I like finding things that were once glorious or potentially glorious at least, and then bringing them to the fore. And I saw that with rye, because if you want to drink whiskey, right, rye has got more flavor than any of the other types of whiskey native to its grain type. I saw that I knew that I, I realized as a whiskey drinker, you know, before my time first underage member, I think at the American Bourbon Society, right? So it'd been a long time since I'd been drinking. And I'd gone from bourbon to never really got into rye. And it was not until Tuttleton and bourbon, all the different types of bourbon, all the different types of scotch. And so I saw Rye as having a big potential. And, you know, frankly, uh, it's been, it was a huge success. It is a huge success. And it wasn't an easy journey. I know you went through a lot of hoops, uh, a lot of struggles. You know, if somebody Ooh. Googles you now and Whistlepig, so Ooh. much interviews, so many different things come up. What was your lowest moment in building the Whistlepig? And what was your, you know, you went home and like, wow, you know what? I did it moment. Do you recall? You know, it was at, at the moment that I start, I, the moment that I started Whistlepig, the moment I did the partnership with Dave, which was December of 2009, I never had a single doubt that it was going to be a success. But the low moment came, like, I would say three months before, like, really pulling it together with Whistlepig. I was, what, 34 years old. I was dead broke. I had raised some money for the vodka deal. We're in the middle of a terrible recession. I w ran through that money on the vodka deal, had nothing left. And I realized that here I am with grand ambitions as a child, 34, dead broke, with nothing to show for it, but a broken down farm. And it looked pretty bad because I had no credit, not in the sense that the credit markets were frozen. Um, I'm on a lake and you're listening to some of the kids uh, run around. and. It was just, that was a dark time. But the moment I, 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 the moment I had, I found the juice through Dave. I knew I had a famous master distiller. I knew I had a magic name. And then it was just like a rocket. It was riding a rocket afterwards. Now, of course, there's a lot of hard work in making a rocket launch happen, right? The, yeah. the, but it was, it was, it was off the ground. Of course, I learned a lot. I mean, I literally learned of like, you know, be careful who you partner with, most of all in business. Partnerships in business are basically have all the challenges of marriage without the benefits of sex. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, my, 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 my son uh, said that. <laughs> it's like he's like, my, Daddy, my time to go. He said, yeah. he said the bad word. <laughs> yes, the X word. Um, the whistle pick story is really important to the viewers here because I want them to understand and see the struggles you've been through. And, you know, you were not spoon fed. You went through lows, ups, highs, downs, and you created something uh, when no one really was thinking about it. Uh, it wasn't a category when you started. It became a category because, partly because of you. 
and the success you have with Whistlepig, you have the vision to be able to see down the future and take something and create something. And I think that's a, something you really learned from Whistlepig. Now you're going to apply to Bhakta and knowing what you know, all the struggles, I think it's going to get, the success is going to come quicker. So let's, let's talk about Bhakta. Tell us about Bhakta. Yeah. Well, Bhakta it's, 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 it's interesting. I, I, I really came about it. Sorry, just a second. Mom, mom, just can you, anyway, domestic, there you go. So I wasn't going to put my name on it, right? Um, because it's not, a, you know, B-H-A-K-T-A, -A. Bhakta is not what you think about. Uh, it's not what the marketing people would uh, tell you to, to come out with. But I followed a French tradition, basically, and, you know, the big brands, they're also American tradition. You know, think of Jack Daniels, Jim Beam, a lot of brands. When you're really proud of something, you put your name on it. And let me tell you why I put my name on it. So, you know, over the course of the past decade, I became pretty familiar, certainly with whiskey, but with other spirits of like, where is value? Um, as a businessman uh, and as a producer of a, of a product, and, and I even go back to the early days of Whistlepig, we provided great value, uh, was to deliver something truly rare and superior to my customers. And I travel the world. I think whiskey basically is overpriced. I can tell you whiskey is overpriced. I mean, I played a large role in making it overpriced, but it is very overpriced right now. Um, to get a good whiskey, well, there are a couple of exceptions, but let me put that to the side for a moment. Traveled basically the entire planet and found in a sleepy corner of France, particularly the Armagnac region, uh, craft on a level that we haven't had in this country for 150 years. I mean, real farmers with wood burning stills in the fields, uh, vintages going back to 1868. And that, that really blew me away because we have just about the oldest vintages in the world. But think about this. You know, in the Bakta 50, there are eight vintages. The youngest is from 1970. The youngest, the youngest is 50 years old. All right, that's when America won the space race. Can you imagine it was 50 years ago? Put a man on the moon. The oldest is from 1868. 1868. You know, the, 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 there was a guy named Napoleon III, right, on the French throne. Queen Victoria was in the middle of her reign of the British Empire. You know, I mean, the world was so different. And then it s survived in France through three German invasions and three occupations. You know, and by the way, what's the first thing that goes when your town gets occupied? Well, uh, your liquor, food supplies, food, your liquor yeah, goes, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, the, yeah, the, you the, have the, the soldiers, have the hide, soldiers, is gone. yeah, the soldiers, you know, are after basically booze and sex, uh, frankly. <laughs> and that this, uh, that this survived all of that is just itself an amazing piece of, of history. And then the taste. So when you, when, when, unlike cognac, which is distilled twice, this is distilled once. And here's the interesting thing, Jazz. It's a rougher distillate when it's young, but that same stuff that makes it rough when it's young is what gives it such character and boldness when it's really old. So you need a rough spirit, so to speak, when it's going into the barrel if you want to age it for a really long time. But the result, and I think of the racehorse with this, right? It's the crazy, nutty racehorse. It's got way too much energy. It's kicking the stalls. It's going mad. That, that, but if you can actually discipline that horse and you can get it running down the track in a good way, that's the champion, right? And that's what Armagnac is. And it's just a true, and here's the interesting thing. Armagnac is actually an uh, agriculturally rich region that people didn't need to go anywhere, right? I mean, and a lot of times there were this overpopulation in Europe and, 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 and in many different places where the people had to leave. And it was sort of true in Cognac. There were these immigrants that came in and it was an Irish guy's Hennessy, right? Uh, which is the biggest brand. They didn't have much money, so they needed to go, and they were next to the trading city of Bordeaux. So Cognac blows up. Armagnac remains in a sleepy corner, and they keep stocking it away. And the savings supplies of all the farmers in Armagnac 
it was their old Armagnac supplies. So there were actually stocks. Now, all of the stocks of all of Armagnac in the world is tiny. It's, 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 it's less than how much Jack Daniels gets drank in a day. So it's relatively nothing, but it's enough to bring people into this, sure. uh, into this region. And there are four things. And these are four things to remember that really drive me and then uh, 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 about the brand. And I think they're the, that are truly the pillars of the brand. It's rare. And that's implicit in a 50-year age statement, only 38 barrels. But, you know, it's clear. 38 barrels, 50-year age statement. This stuff is rare. It's exquisite. You've tasted it. You've got it. I'll let you talk about that in a second. The, it has, it is an investment. And... I think at this point, look, I'm a commercial animal, I'm a businessman. This bottle at $250 is a, it, it, it's gonna be worth 10X. You know, and I go back to releasing the triple one and the early Boss Hogs at Whistlepig. I mean, they're all worth 10 times more. This is gonna be something considerably more than that. Now, don't, you know, it, it's, it's, it's it, it, that's my best guess on things, but I think this is a five, six, 10, $12,000 bottle easy down the line because we're talking about barrel one so it's an investment there aren't many things that you can buy that are in the world of liquor that are yeah. going to go up you don't do that with bubblegum flavored vodka obviously the the and four and this is something very important to me this brand has a mission and the mission is revival because i think we need that in this country right now you know and we got to get 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 past all this this division and hatred and we got to get back to life we got to get back to you know, forward momentum. For me, it's rural revival. I think it's a great time to get out of the cities and move to the country. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that. But, you know, tell me, look, I can look at your liquor collection back there. I'm very biased. What did you think of it? What, what did you, I mean, you were, you, were, you were there when we were tasting some of the component blends. So talk to me, talk to your listeners. Uh, you know, people who know me know that I also drink cognac, brandies, armagnacs, and uh, one thing to point out for people who are not aware of that region, the reason Konya became so popular and it is the number one in the category of brandy is because they're located very close to the ports. So anything that's close to the ports basically gets shipped out throughout the world. And that's the reason why Konya became much more popular. Three and a half hours uh, drive back then, it was a lot more. Now, three and a half hours down, drive down south is where Armagnac region is, but it's not as close to the port. And because of that, cognacs became uh, so popular, and that's why we were, see a lot more cognacs uh, and became uh, a big name uh, as far as uh, from that region goes. Personally, for the, the liquid itself, uh, it, it is phenomenal. It is, it is really good quality. The, the history behind it, the, you know, it, it's, I mean, there's nothing else like it because the whiskey finish that you do also whiskey cask finish that you do also it's very unique it, it gives you that smokiness we tried various different uh blends uh at the time with four different blends and we were divided between two uh, with the entire group and we ended up kind of blending those two and creating a the batch number two and everybody absolutely loved it uh, everybody absolutely loved it so if you're a cognac lover you'll love this product as it is but if you're a whiskey lover, you'll love it even more because it has those hints, those nuances that give you the finish of the smokiness from a peaty whiskey. It has that in it, especially if you put a little bit of water. It's perfect. Yeah, and I think that's an that's an interesting point, Jazz, that you that you brought up. the The point is that from in the Bakta line, uh, which we'll have all together, but particularly in this release, the I'm a whiskey guy from a whiskey background. Frankly, you know, uh, uh, to say I'm offended may be a little bit of a, a strong word, but I see, you know, for people to pay in, for an 18 year age statement in Scotch, they're paying in the mid 200s. Uh, brandy costs, particularly Armagnac costs eight times as much to make. This is aged twice as long. The that's a value point from a taste and a flavor standpoint. There's nothing like this. It yeah. combines the very best of the whiskey world, the very best of the whiskey world. And it mixes that with the very best of the brandy world. And the fruit of the vine 
is more elegant than, you know, and, and this is distilled wine, basically. That's what Armagnac is and brandy is instead of distilled beer. But I love whiskey. Whiskey's terrific. I really love whiskey. But if you bring the two together, you've got something that's better together than it is each one of them independently. And some of the purists may get upset and say, well, you should never do that. But, you know, they can, uh, they can continue to be unhappy. <laughs> um, what are the common myths you feel for the people who are trying to advocate this to, you know, is the whiskey crowd, right? Because you have a little whiskey twist to us. Uh, what are the common myths for those people to try to understand this product a little bit better in your perspective? Sorry, say that again, Jez. What, what is your perspective on having a whiskey drinker giving this a try and trying it out? Besides the age statement versus, you know, uh, whiskey, as far as I mean, who look, wants uh, to for, for people who are, there's a couple of questions here that I think we should we should um, we should answer to somebody. Uh, but I'll, I'll I'll let me answer yours uh, quickly. Uh, Jess, I think look for for many. Sorry, this is my son here. For many uh, whiskey drinkers, right? They have tried Ethan, son. Please. Um, for a lot of whiskey drinkers, you know, they've tried the various bourbons. And frankly, if you tried a lot of whiskeys in general, bourbons rise, you've tried a lot of young craft, underage stuff that, you know, probably overpaid for, frankly. Um, and you've tried some of the, 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 the various scotches, you've tried the rise, and, you know, you've been there, done that. I sort of reached that in the thing. And, 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 and you know, you love whiskey, but this is, this is a bridge product to a new world of brandy, which I think is a more elegant, flavorful world, while it actually maintains, it drinks like a whiskey. It really drinks like whiskey. And what are the best attributes of the whiskey of whiskey and spirits in general? I'll say you want to you want to combine very high levels of character with very high levels of smoothness. And they're normally inversely related. Right. You get a lot of character. It's not very smooth. He's got something very smooth, not a lot of character. By the way, this is true in people. Right. <laughs> The generally a big character is not a very smooth guy, right? The the now let's say you're on looking for a best friend or somebody to sit next to on a flight to China, you don't want to sit next to a totally boring guy. Yeah, or true. You want to sit next to a guy who can't shut up the entire time, right? Yeah. That balance between the character and the smoothness is what you look for in a spirit, and it's what you look for in a best friend. The best yeah. whiskeys in the world have that. Whistlepig has that. Yeah. This has that in spades on a much larger scale, right? So you want to talk about rarity, we've got more, more rare. You want to talk about flavor, we've got more flavor. You want to talk about value, no one's giving you delivering greater value. I, I put my mother into it, right? So I got her 10 barrels of bottle one, the, the, sorry, 10 bottles of barrel one, just as an investment, right? The, 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 so I believe that totally to the point that I put my mother in it. And, you know, if you and if you're an optimistic person, this message of revival is key and we're doing it. We're putting we're creating jobs in America. We're creating jobs in rural America. We're planting vines in fields that used to be fallow. Um, so I think I got a little off topic there. But if you're if you're That's a whiskey right. drinker and you try this, I think you'll realize that a new world has opened up. Now, I will say when you're trying it in the beginning, um, drink it you know, slightly chilled, right? The, the, and take a tiny sip first, because if you gulp it in the beginning, which by the way, it's 50 years old. So, I mean, don't gulp it in any event. It's pretty yeah, rare. You caught us taking a shot of it, right? You caught us taking a shot of it at the farm over the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh God. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's forgiven. It was America's birthday. Um, but take a tiny sip for it and acclimate it. You know, acclimate your, your taste buds to it. It, it is, it'll be reminiscent of whiskey, but unique at the same time. And dip your, you know, dip your toes, dip your toes into it. Gotcha. Um, we've had a bunch of questions which came in. So I just want to take a moment to answer those right after this uh, one topic I just want to talk about. Um, you said revival was the number four. 
So let's talk about revivalist. I mean, the way you're going, you've already done this with Whistle Peg. You went through a different way of marketing the product. You have a different approach. You're, this, this product, if you're looking for it, you have to go through a revivalist. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, the revivalist program uh, basically was put together for a couple of uh, for a couple of reasons is that I wanted to work with people who really knew whiskey, who had a constituency of following uh, in whiskey, because I think we've got a message uh, to the whiskey drinker that there's a better alternative. Uh, in terms of, you know, for the general, when I mean general public, this isn't really the general public we're talking to here because it's generally people who are really into spirits. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the revivalist program basically is through revivalists of which you're one you get access to uh, special vintages uh, you can come visit the farm participate in our parties which we have um, the the like it's actually uh, you know in rural America you can have a party still um, it's a playboy the, club for whiskey enthusiasts that's right <laughs> That's right. I know in, in many ways it is. In many ways it is. The, the, so the Revivalist program, basically, through Revivalist, you have special access to our vintages going back to 1868. I can tell you in the United States of America, we have the oldest vintages. We have the oldest stuff in the country. The, the, so it's a, it's a spirit lover's dream. And you're having, you know, your father's having a birthday. Uh, it was 1955. We'll get you a bottle. We'll get you a bottle at a great price. Uh, you have full access to the vintages, uh, our property. Uh, you can do that in Florida, in Vermont, or if you're over in Europe and France. And that's only through Revivalists. So how does that work? If somebody's looking for a bottle, they reach out to one of the Revivalists. And basically, we point them in the right direction. Yeah. So you direct, like for example, if you're listening, if you're if for for you know jazz tonight's poison, to say, listen, um, I'd like a. I know barrel one is sold out, right? We've put a couple yep. aside. Sold out quick. And the 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 uh, it was yeah it was basically uh, gone first day. We have a couple aside. I'd really like a bottle of uh, of barrel one. Direct message jazz. Jazz will send in the request and why, you know, you should get it. And you can get things like that because he and other revivalists have a direct relationship with me, right? And that can, you know, uh, that gives you front of the line for new releases uh, like the 35-year-old, the 18-year-old, um, you know, your birthday vintages. Uh, but thanks for bringing up that point, Jazz, I forgot. So basically, they're the gatekeepers. The revivalists are the gatekeepers to the stocks, the special yeah. stocks. And they're really all special, but the special, 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 special stocks. Uh, we have some questions. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes to just answer some questions because they're coming in, and we don't want to eventually run out of time. So gonna, the questions should pop up on your screen, too. I see them. I see them. Um, so how will you produce well, your product like when the aged inventory runs out? Great question. Yeah. So uh, that is a great question. So pipeline, look, the key to the business, the key if you're serious about the spirits business is you have to build pipeline. I thought I had a long pipeline with like a 10 year old statement at, 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 at my previous whiskey company. Now we have a 55 or 50 year pipeline. I can hold that inventory. So right now we've got 38 barrels coming out. The, that will hold for a while and then slowly start going down. And that's where you're going to see, and that'll be at the same time that demand is going up. So you're going to see prices uh, rise, which is why this is an appreciating asset. So I think you'll see for a long time into the future, a 50 year age statement of Bakta out there, but it's going to become very, very expensive. Um, and then we'll launch a 35 year somewhere in the mid to upper hundreds in the beginning, and that will begin rising. Then we'll have an 18, the same sort of thing, you know, will happen, which is why it's a great time to get in uh, now, put a group together and, and buy. And then we're going to back into farm production. So it's the same thing, actually, that the model that I had previously at, the, at, at Whistlepig, which, which is basically get the great inventories, bring it in. In this case, 
you know, much older at Bakta, but back into farm-based production. So we've got vineyards growing in Vermont. Yep. Incidentally, Vermont, uh, while not known for wine, um, uh, produces a highly acidic grape, which if that's your thing in wine, it's great. But for brandy, it's perfect. Good, yeah. Um, so we'll be backing into the farm, an estate uh, product, which we'll probably put out when it's about uh, uh, what they call a Napoleon age, um, a guy who I'm a fan of, uh, which is about six years old, and that'll be coming from the farm. So age stuff will basically get rare, and then prices will go up, right, way up. And then we'll back into younger products so we can keep a seamless uh, a seamless pipeline. Will you be blending stuff from Armagnac with the stuff grown here? Uh, yes. So I think in the very beginning, let's say it's going to be two or three years before our grapes are producing here. Right. Then you're so, about three to four years, right? Yeah, three, yeah. four years to produce. And then, uh, and then after that, uh, you know, it's, we'll at least put it in for a couple of years and I'll probably send it to Florida and put it into no because aging is much faster in the heat. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll start blending in our older stock. So we maintain a very high quality product because you can't put, you know, you can't put young juice out there and expect it to be great. You, you just can't, but young juice adds a nice, uh, fruitiness to a blend. Yeah. We got some more questions here. We'll continue with the questions. Another good question. The you kind of touched on that already. You kind of touched Mossy on that already. Is, but... is, getting, is, getting the, uh, is getting the questions answered. Um, He's also an avid whiskey and cognac drinker. Good man. Good man. So I, I think the brand, here's what I see in five years. I see, I see whistle pig. I see whistle pig. I see Bakta 50 out, um, you know, roughly at around the same volume, probably for $750 to $1,000 a bottle. I think we'll have a 35 year out that's uh, around three, 400. I think we'll have an 18 out that is probably around 199. I think you'll have an XO, so there'll be a lineup. Right, we're starting with 50, and then that'll move up. Then we'll put in a 35, then that'll move up. Then we'll have an 18, that'll move up. So I see the brand as being the brand to own, right? Because it's only a matter of time. Look, it's pretty intuitive, right? When you're offering some people these kind of deep age statements, and you're offering somebody of extraordinary quality, and you know you you have a whiskey drinker who's paying 250 bucks for an 18 year Macallan and then they're paying the same price for a 50-year Bacta, they're going to realize pretty quickly that, that you know, their business is going to smooth over, um, I, I, at least for a significant number of people. Um, and, uh, and, and so I see the brand, you know, being the brand to own among the people who know in the spirits world. Scotch Father is helping. Uh, Jay, if you guys don't know, Jay is an amazing guy. Please make sure you follow him. Uh, just to also mention, make sure you follow Raj Bhakta and Bhakta Brandy and Bhakta Farm Farms uh, to stay on top of information. So Scotch Father is helping me field questions that are in the chat. Someone asked who your mentors were growing up in this business and who helped guide you. So I'm going I'm to reveal, reveal how totally crazy I, I am. Um, so when I was like 11 years old, I read this book about Napoleon. I fell in love with Napoleon. Then I fell in love with Churchill, you know, so, um, you know, the great heroes, I guess, of Western civilization were, were my, I guess, you know, heroes in terms of mentor, mentor, or somebody that, you know, um, people who really, you know, there was one individual a guy named Charlie Marinoff who really mentored me through the liquor business. And he was then the CEO and chairman of a company called uh, Charmer Sunbelt, uh, which is now Breakthrough, and he's co-chairman of that. He really gave me, because when I was getting into the business, a lot of people told me that you don't understand this business, it's different, you don't know what you're doing, it's a particular thing. And, you know, I would go to Charlie, uh, who was a big guy, a very big guy in the business, who would take the time to talk to me. He was, he, was the, he, was, he was the biggest. He was the top two in the country. Yeah. Right. There was Southern Glazer and there was Charmer Sunbelt Group. Right. The top. And, so he was the top two. 
and he would take the time to talk to me. So he was a really helpful uh, guy to me. Dave, very humble guy. Very wonderful human being. Uh, Charlie Marinoff. Dave, Dave was very helpful to me. Dave, Dave knew the business. Dave also gave me confidence because he was, he had been there through the mark, you know, he, he, he arrived at Maker's Mark when it was 100,000 cases. He left when it was a couple million cases. So he saw all of that. And a lot of my ideas were unconventional and Dave was very supportive of that. And, I, and you need that because I didn't know about this. I mean, hell, I didn't even know if the distributors were also mafiosos or not and they might pop me or whatever. <laughs> so, so really, I'm not, I'm not you, you're laughing, but I'm not, I, I, I didn't know. True. Uh, uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because when, as and my father about and my breaking father. into the industry, um, it, it's, any major industry, it's almost like a mafia control. It's tough to break in. And then people tell you, oh, you don't know anything about this, you know, because they know you're trying to, you're a small guy trying to make it big and they try to put you down, but you never gave up. And because you're an out of box thinker, you found a couple of people that you, you know, supported you and here you are today, which is amazing. Never give up, right? Persistence. That's right. That's right. I mean, that's one one big thing and look it's depressing you pick up the you pick up the you pick up the newspaper i was going to say you pick up your telephone there's a lot of depressing news so i think people should just turn it off and and have a drink you know and come up with uh, optimistic visions of their future and start marching in that direction uh got a couple more questions for you i'm not sure if you want to answer all of it or not there's certain things Yay okay, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'll we'll try to do this fast, all right? So we get through a lot of these. Why Isla and what Isla Cast a Distillery? So why Isla? The the combination. Uh, farmer in France had lost a bet with somebody in Scotland, who somehow he ended up with a barrel. I think it was in a Bunahaven barrel, um, and uh, the farmer put his Armagnac into the Isla. He gave me a taste of it. It was a eureka moment. I love the combination of sweet and smoky. Uh, that's why Isla, um, which I, we have a combination of Isla uh, casks. Um, so, you know, you've got the usual suspects. You've got, you know, uh, the, the, you got the Lafroy, you got the, got the Lagavulin. A lot of the pieces that go into the Johnny Walker blends are from uh, those places. Some of the Buna Havens are smoky and, and represented. We've got a broad, pretty much, uh, we've got all the casks from uh, most of the known players in the Isle of Region, which is what produces the, for those, you know, few people who don't have the, the peaty, smoky scotches. And uh, by the way, incidentally, in the future, I think we'll have other, um, uh, other whiskeys as well. Yes, and to answer this other question is, is if the Isla cast can overpower the delicate, uh, Armagnac notes, which is why you should make it fast and not use an extremely heavily peated barrel. Fantastic. Um, let's see. I have some other questions that I was fielding for the last day, the last 24 hours that people sent me directly. Uh, Single Malt Walt, great account, uh, a leader out in UK. He's asking, what's the plans for this brand in Europe? Uh, you know, I'm going to get, I'm, I'm, I, I think, you know, if we go anywhere, it'll be in London. Uh, it'll be in England, uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of great uh, whiskey lovers there. And I have a couple of great partners uh, from, you know, my previous whiskey days there. And we'll be working with them. Um, and, you know, and new people. But I think, you know, first, we got to take care of of, of job one of get things going here, I would say within the next year, we'll, we'll start, you know, some activity uh, in, uh, in, in, in London, in the UK. Awesome. And somebody else asked, uh, what all places did you explore during your, you know, after Whistlepig and touring the world? In India, what places did you tour? Because you went around to different different countries. Yeah, I spent, I, I particularly spent some time. Uh, you didn't land on Armagnac. You, Land in army after yeah. visiting the places. So, so India, a number of places. Had a really good time at the uh, Paul John uh, uh, Distillery. Great, uh, uh, great product. Very, very good people. 
Um, spent a lot of time in Scotland. Uh, one of my uh, good friends and business partners as, uh, is a unique maverick guy out of Glasgow. He's got tens of thousands of unique barrels from also all around the world. So spent a good amount of time there. Of course, any of the usual sp suspects uh, of uh, Ireland uh, and Japan, uh, the whole Caribbean, you know, rum uh, tour, um, the even in the Philippines, uh, you know, pretty much if there was old spirits, uh, uh, I was there. And I will tell you, it was not even a close matter when it came to Armagnac. It wasn't even like, oh, it, should I do Armagnac or, you know, Japanese whiskey? The, the, it was not even, it was not even close because it's about value. Awesome. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the packaging because uh, obviously you have a fantastic packaging. What inspired you uh, with the packaging and uh, how did this come about? And obviously you have a beautiful box that it comes in. So what's your inspiration behind it? I want to say something about that box. We were getting our boxes made in China. And then when this whole, you know, flu business uh, broke out, I decided to make it all, uh, make it all here. Our supply ch chains broke out and I figured to keep the business. That's from our own cedar on our own farm that we take the, from the tree to producing the box. I'm very proud of the team that we were able to do that fast. Box aside, everybody's doing the same sort of bottle. You know, when they created Whistlepig 10 years ago, it was, you know, it was, it was new. It was cool. Uh, but now everything's sort of like this. Very art deco. Very yeah. art deco design. So I wanted something new, right? I wanted something it's heavy. Clean. I yeah. wanted something that stood out both in the cognac section and the, and, and, and the whiskey section. It's a totally new, fresh look on it. And the balance between, and we're talking about a modern design, by the way, Art Deco is, you know, 100 years old at this point, but it's optimistic. That's the Empire States building. That's the Chrysler building. That's like looking upward into the skies. That's optimism to me. And, uh, you know, it's a nice framing of the letters in my name. I wish I could share the PDF for this, but it's not going to be the same thing. The book, you guys have to see and read the book. I read the PDF for this before the book was created. And it just sucks you in the story. Read, read, see, read, read, the, read the opening sentence, Jez. Read the opening sentence. It's what you now possess is perhaps the rarest drink known to mankind. Yeah. What you now in, possess. Is that coming in backwards, by the way? It looks to me backwards, yeah. yeah. yeah like, <laughs> We're not drinking yet. <laughs> I feel like George W. now. Like, what what do you what you now possess perhaps the rarest drink known to mankind? What you now that possess is perhaps the rarest drink known to mankind. And I believe that. So there's a lot of great storytelling. Uh, can you just describe the book a little bit, like a little summarize the book a little bit? What this is and what people can expect from when they get a bottle and this book is inside there. So I, uh, it's really a good read, um, if I do say so myself. And it's the story of Armagnac. It's the story of how I got there. That's the story of me taking an elephant across the Rio Grande with the mariachi band playing when I was running for Congress. Your wife chasing after you? This is how I found Armagnac, particularly because my wife was chasing me out of the house with a broom because she's pissed off at me. So I got in the car and drove to the Armagnac region for the first time. It's really the whole story of it and how it's brought to America and the farm in Vermont. And then, you know, it, 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 it ends with sort of, well, what's the purpose of all this? That there's a message in this bottle, right? That this is something, and think about this, that the trees that the 1868 vintage would have gone to were from 250 years ago, right? In a time where the That's European true. empires ruled the world. And you can taste all of that. And I think, again, I'm a, I'm a historian. I think, like, what's the message in this? So if you think if you were a French mother sending your son off to war in 1939 when the Nazis were invading, things would have looked pretty bad. But chances are your son would have made it. And by 1946, which is also both of those years in the vintage, the sun was rising and freedom was, you know, coming back to life. So it's never as bad. And this is to me what what Bach the 50 says in all the vintages. It's, you know, there's a line in Kipling's poem, if, if, you can, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat both those imposters just the same. And you think about that. If, triumph and disaster are both imposters. You're never quite as up as you think you are. You're never quite as down 
as you think you are the country. And I think that's something that we need to remember in this country right now in the world. Um, great point, Dr. Brandy. Thank you, uh, whoever's managing that tonight. Uh, the PDF of the book can be found on the website. So you guys can read up on it. I think it's a great read. It's a really fun read. And it will be and nice. It comes, and way, it comes, with you. A question, and it comes in every box, that, you know, that's ordered. And if you ask for it, yeah, Robin Cooper, and you'll be a man, my son. Exactly right. The, <laughs> that's, the, that's the poem if you can dream, but not make dreams your master. If you can think, but not make thoughts your aim. Um, anyway, we digress. The book is great. You should get it preferably with the brandy which and that booklet comes in each one which is all which are all numbered um and if you email us you can email me i think at rpb at bakta farms uh dot com the and you want a hard copy we'll mail one to you and if that doesn't close the deal then you know i don't know what will <laughs> so Thank you again, Raj. This is uh, fantastic. We learned a lot. If there's any other questions, guys, please, we still have a few more minutes. I think we have about seven or eight minutes left on Instagram Live before it cuts us out. Raj, this is your first time, but Instagram lasts for one hour, and then it just shuts off on you. So <laughs> give a, a five, seven-minute warning. Uh, if you guys have any questions, let's see. I think I did have some more questions pop up here. Uh, Oh, okay. This is, yes. I think all the batches are going to be different. Do you know that? Yeah. That's a good name. Um, asks, how different are the batches? Um, you'll be able to tell that the flavor profile is going to be, you'll say, okay, I'm drinking Bacta. Um, but you'll find different different you know varieties like say we may finish one of them in a rye cask right so you won't you won't you'll be you'll be down on the you know you won't get the isla or we put it very very sh for a very short period of time in isla and then give it a pinch of rye for a little bit of spice there'll be minor minor nuances which is why each barrel itself is is a collector's item really um, because, you know, they're all going to be excellent, um, but they're all going to be, uh, modestly or, or slightly rather, uh, unique. So, you know, the ideal would be to get, yeah, that's a lot of money now that I think about it. The, the <laughs> but if you had all, if you had one of all 38, I mean, that's a hell of a collection. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, somebody's got a good question in regards to just operationally right now, you guys just launched over the weekend. Actually, you know what? Tell us a little bit about the weekend that we just went through. It will um, speak to being part of the revivalist. And once you guys start purchasing a bottle, you guys start coming in the network, you'll be able to experience these type of things in the near future. Can you tell us a little bit about what we did at this weekend? Yeah. So, so we had a, a target to launch on the 4th of July, which we kept despite the, you know, the, the flu season we're in, the horrible flu season. <laughs> um, and we had um, uh, a couple of select uh, folks come up to the farm to help, uh, well, see the place. These are the revivalists um, who you can, you know, they can identify themselves and you can direct a message who came up to basically see what we're doing and participate in the finalize, finalization of barrel two in effect, uh, which, uh, which is coming out. And the debate really centered around whether we wanted more or less smoke. We had like a parliamentary style, like hollering, screaming debate between both sides of whether it was more or less, you know, uh, smoke. But the idea was to give these guys uh a feel for the brand and a feel for the product and you know bring them uh into the bakta uh farm in vermont and get a taste of the various profiles and this is what's available uh to you through the revivalists if you want to get a group of people together come up you know and be our guest so i will say one thing in regards to that and there was a thought that i had after the the Zoom meeting we had yesterday. You know, I do uh, something once a year. It's about the community. It's about networking. It's less about business. It's less about networking for your benefit. It's more about sharing your passion. 
I do this once or twice a year. And this year, because of the COVID situation, it got died out. I was supposed to go to Japan also on a distillery tour. But in the near future, hopefully in, in fall, September maybe, I would love to get a few people who are whiskey enthusiasts, such as myself, people who follow me. I have a good network of those guys to come up to the farm. Obviously, we can't have 20 people, but a select group. Uh, I would love to have them come up to the farm, check out the whole operation, and uh, try and uh, talk about uh, your product. And everybody brings different whiskeys and uh, different cognacs from around the world, and we kind of share the passion and we learn together. No, that we, we, we'd be happy. We'd be happy to host. Uh, we'd be happy to host the group. And you know, we we I think take uh, take hospitality seriously and can show people. Look, and here's the thing. You can buy your spirits from some big nameless, faceless corporation that throws up a bunch of marketing mumbo jumbo, and that's basically ninety-five percent of uh, of of uh, of spirits companies. Now, you know what? Let me let me say. The interesting is that some of those big companies produce absolutely fantastic products. The the that are basically soulless gigantic corporations. The on the other hand, you've got like some mom and pop shops that are producing, frankly, not so great stuff. Um, but the interesting thing that we do is that it all goes back to the farm, right? If there's a family, there's a person, it all ties back to the farm and anything that I'm involved in, whether it's the Bakta brandy project, whether it's the rum that we're going to be putting out that's coming from uh, the, the ranch in Florida. That was going to be my next question too. You have some great projects besides if you're part of the revivalist. If you're part of the team, if you have own a bottle, you have access to all this information. You're working on a couple of different projects in the next couple of years. Yeah, so so I mean, I love rum. Um, we've got a ranch uh, down there in Florida. We're growing the cane. We're starting to produce it. I've also bought some beautiful uh, old rum, and I really, you know, I mean, I put my name on Bakta, uh, my on the brandy, the because I think that it is truly unsurpassed in the entire history world in history in a bottle it's history in the bottle it's all those things but i'm a big believer in rum i continue to love whiskey i think with respect to whiskey world whiskeys is going to be uh the future what's the best whiskey in the world well it's a combination of the best whiskeys in the world like you know the 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 you know planet earth ireland scotland america canada india japan uh to name a few um, but all the products should tie back to places and you should know who you're buying your products from, you know, and, and go visit the places and go see them and see the person, you know, behind it. And, you know, some people think I'm an asshole. You can think I'm an asshole, you know, don't buy it from me, <laughs> but at least come and know the person and know, um, you know, know who you're, you know, know who you're buying from, know what they're about. And I can tell you one thing and we can, you know, wrap this thing up. The, we the, got a two minute warning uh, coming up on the screen anyway. I think there's there's one thing here that I take very, very seriously. Um, well, there are many things that I take very, very seriously, but the, the here's what I promise to you know you and all of your listeners. I am deadly serious about providing the greatest value uh, and the most unique product in the entire world of spirits uh in this product and uh i feel very very proud uh to have found it. i'm very very lucky to have found it. i'm very lucky to have found a, uh uh the chateau with the oldest spirits in the world and the guy was just you know happened to want to get rid of it it's rare it's exquisite it's an appreciating asset i.e an investment and it's driven by a, a wonderful and great and uh timely purpose so uh I hope to meet uh, some of you who are listening someday on the farm here or in France or uh, in, uh, in Florida. And I wish you all uh, very well. Jazz, thank you for uh, having me in your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated, Raj. We appreciate I know you're a busy man. You got four kids. You got a family uh, to take care of also. But we really appreciate it. He's a super humble guy. But one thing that I want you to understand is there is leaders and their followers. He's a leader. Uh, he can foresee the future. He has done it before. He's doing it with this product. You guys are all coming on board at the beginning, very beginning stage of this brand, which is going to be super successful. I'm proud to be a part of it to help talk about it and educate the people. That's what I try to do here on Instagram. Thank you so much. Five seconds of counting down. Raj, thank you from the bottom of my heart.
Wish you the best of luck. Thank you guys for joining. God Cheers. bless. Take care. Bye-bye.